All right, it says we're live, so we're live. I hope uh, somebody get on here and let me know if you can hear me, if the audio and the video is okay. Everybody, hey, good to see you. Come on in. My name is Michael Bunker. This is the Bunker Nation Show. I'm going to be your host for the evening. If you are here, let me know. Uh, get into the comment section, type into it. This is the way I start every show. Just telling you to push on in here, gather in. Uh, come into the comment section right where you are. Say hi, greet, greetings, etc. Hello, Pat. Hello, Daniel. Good to see you. I'm here. I hope you're here too. It's going to get dark during this program, most likely, and I'm not using the uh, glaring light. Hello, Matt. Hello, Ethan. Good to see you guys. Uh, like I said, push on in here. Let me know where you are. Have us here. In uh, humid Miami, Matt's in Lynchburg, Virginia. All right, good to see you guys. Hey, hope everybody's doing all right. Beautiful day, Central Texas today. Spent it with my wife, hanging out. We uh, uh, went to town and uh, and went to the gym early this morning, and then we went to town and uh, we had to take the dog to go get a haircut. Something you would have probably not caught me doing in the past. Or, or me uh, traipsing along. But Danielle and I decided they have a uh, festival in Coleman, Texas every year called Fiesta, Fiesta de la Paloma, the Feast of the Dove. It's for dove hunting season. And it's always fun. So we went and they had a big car show, old cars, all kinds of stuff. It was pretty cool. So we did that. We hung around and uh, then came home. And I've been reading and doing stuff uh, ever since then. Hello, Dolly from Arkansas or Arizona. One of those. I think that's uh, Arizona. I always get the A's mixed up. Uh, hello, Wardogheim from the Blue Skies of Montana. Good to see you. You guys pile on in here. Hit the like button. we got some stuff we're going to talk about. As most of you know, if you are regulars, this is like a place where you come. You can get educated. You can learn things you probably never heard before. Common sense, reasonableness uh, reigns here. Today, we got a couple of topics, but as always, I'm here to talk about whatever you want to talk about, and this conversation could go in any direction. And that's one reason a lot of people like this show, because we can talk about whatever you want to talk about. You just type it in the comment section. I may or may not decide to talk about it, but I will always be here for you and to answer your questions, etc. I got to do the box thing. I can't forget that, but after the box thing, uh, we'll uh, launch into some of our topics for today. That's the box thing, and I also am supposed to greet all you future people. All the future people are the people that will be watching this sometime in the future, Lord willing, on YouTube or wherever. If it doesn't say live on the screen right, uh, screen right now, then you're not watching it live. You're watching it in the future. You are a future person. So greetings to all the future people. Hit the like button. Subscribe to the channel. Hit the little bell icon so you get notifications when I go live. So uh, a couple of the topics I wrote down for today, we're going to talk about conspiracy theories because here we are and Facebook and Twitter are completely boiling over with conspiracy theories. So we're going to talk a little bit about that, how to think, how should we think about conspiracy theories? Because I hate to be the one to tell you this, but people are really, really stupid. And so we're going to talk about that. And then I also want to talk about a uh, novel that I've requested that you read over several shows called A Day in the Life of Ivan Denisovich or Ivan Denisovich, however you want to say it. All right. We got a question. We'll start with that. How do you think the latest coronavirus cases affects all the controversy? Supreme Court riots, election uh, mail-in, et cetera. I think it makes uh, calm down. I don't think it's going to calm down. I think it just adds another element. Um, it has pushed some things off the headlines. And so we're not talking about taxes anymore. <laughs> I haven't seen anybody talking about taxes except for really, really stupid people in the comment section who still think that uh, it, that's important. So I don't really think it's going to calm down, but we're going to see how it goes. <laughs> All right. So um, we're going to talk about conspiracy theories because right now there's a bunch of them going around. The most... Uh, uh, the one I've seen the most is that somehow this is a uh, this uh, the president getting COVID is an assassination attempt, a deep state removing 
the president or somebody doing it before the election to throw the whole thing into chaos and to cause more trouble so that the revelation revolution will come. So we're just going to talk about conspiracy theories in general. Then you can apply what I teach you to that or any other conspiracy theory. All right. So the way to do this, first of all, I have to be uh, straightforward with you up front. If you haven't watched me before, if you're brand new, everybody else knows this, but if you're brand new, I am a uh, supporter or someone who believes in conspiracy theories. Not all of them. That would be silly. But I believe that most of the major events of history can be provably shown to be a result of conspiracies. I cannot be a coincidence theorist because I'm too smart. And you would have to be really, really stupid to believe that a lot of the major things that have happened in the world have happened coincidentally. And since I don't think most of you are stupid, I'm going to go ahead and uh, uh, move forward just saying that just because you believe in conspiracy theories, you believe that human beings totally depraved from their mother's womb, who are fallen, who seek their own, their own good, gather together in some cases, utilizing their conglomerated power however that works, to accomplish things that benefit themselves. You would have to be really stupid not to believe that those things happen. You would also have to deny almost all of history. So if you don't think that the beer hall push <laughs> was a conspiracy, or if you don't believe that there was a conspiracy to kill Julius Caesar, or if you don't believe there was a conspiracy to kill Christ, despite the fact that it's documented, not much I can say to you. Most of the things that have happened in the world have happened conspiratorially. We know for a fact, it's a fact, that the 1960 election was stolen for JFK. Don't care. It's just a fact. There's very little possibility that John F. Kennedy was killed by a lone gunman. Perhaps you believe that, and that's fine if you do. So conspiracies happen. You also have to be really dumb to believe all of them. And so let me tell you the foundation of how to think. Here's how not to get taken in by things that are silly and ridiculous and that will lead you far astray. The first thing you want to learn is a thing called Occam's Razor. O-C-C-A-M apostrophe S. Occam's Razor. Occam's Razor. I'm going to paraphrase. I'm not going to read you the definition of it. But basically, it's the position or the philosophy that an assumption, or excuse me, a posit, a position that requires more unknowns or more assumptions is probably less likely to be the correct one than a position that requires fewer assumptions. So if there's fewer assumptions or fewer things that they don't know they're just guessing at, the one with the fewest assumptions is probably right. It doesn't say that it is right. It says it's most likely right. And this will serve you in a lot of areas of your life. It also will show you that most of what passes for science in the social media age is not science. And it goes completely against Occam, Occam's razor. There's a corollary idea you might also want to know. And that is that extraordinary claims require extraordinary proof. Also, this disproves almost every science headline that comes across your social media. They're almost all bullcrap because most of them are based on way too many assumptions. Their methodology is wrong and they make assumptions based on things that could never happen in real life. So when they tell you they found uh, some gas that possibly came from microbes on Venus and everybody around you who's a science nerd starts masturbating because they think there's life on Venus, just realize their methodology is completely bass backwards. And they're making so many assumptions that cannot possibly they cannot possibly know. And they do this because that's how you get money. So these things happen all the time. Also a conspiracy. So if you know Occam's razor, 
And you know this uh, corollary idea that extraordinary claims require extraordinary proof. You can start to look at conspiracies and ask yourself a few questions. Generally, using Occam's razor, if a conspiracy theory requires way too many unknowns and assumptions, things that you cannot possibly know, and let me tell you this, this is going to bother you, but you don't know anything. How many times have you heard me tell you that? You don't know anything. Just because you read a story, just because some event, you're told some event is happening, you don't know it. You just assume that some element or some part of the story is right, but you're making an assumption. You have no idea. Even people who think that right now the president of the United States is at Walter Reed Hospital, he probably is. That's Occam's razor. But you don't know that. You don't know it personally. So we all do make assumptions and we all choose to believe certain things. And a lot of times we're wrong. History is replete with that, of us all thinking one thing happened when in reality it didn't, all right? So that's the way that that works. Okay, so when you start hearing a, a, a conspiracy theory and there are so many unknowns, there are so many assumptions, the best thing to do is just park it. Put it somewhere and don't spread it and don't, bank on it. Don't make decisions about your life and living about it because you don't know. And people jump in on um, conspiracy theories because of their own worldview. They want things to be true. I personally believe some things that I cannot prove to be true. And you do too. But if we will reasonably apply Occam's razor, we can look at certain things. Which is most likely to be true? That a bunch of people who hated President Kennedy, who stated that they wanted him dead, who were going through operations to train militants to, uh, to assassinate leaders, who uh, is it more likely that those people who happen to all have a, a vested interest work together to assassinate the president? Or is it more likely that a bullet passed through, I don't know, seven wounds, hung up in the mid in midair, and nobody could prove how this happened, and came out pristine. Which is more like which has the most assumptions? They will say it can't have been a conspiracy because um, somebody would have talked. You can't keep a thing like that secret, which is one of the stupidest things people say against conspiracies. They don't have to. That's not the way conspiracies work. They don't keep them secret in most cases. In most cases, they happen right in front of you. And as soon as you see it, they start dumping conspiracy theories, so many of them, that it overwhelms it and you can never know the truth. And they'll say, well, certainly somebody would have talked. They did. <laughs> Hundreds of people who had a reason to know talked, including E. Howard Hunt, who was a CIA agent, who was a shooter, <laughs> on his deathbed, said, I'm one of the guys that killed Kennedy. <laughs> you don't have to know it. You don't have to know it a thousand, a hundred thousand percent. Which is more likely? That a bunch of people were working and were provably working to do this. Admitted it and it happened, or this other theory, which I call the Stephen King theory because it's more fiction than anything he's ever written, is that uh, uh, Lee Harvey Oswald, who was being handled by a CIA handler, <laughs> shot the president and used the magic bullet. All right, <laughs> still got the shovel, that's right. Now let's look at Jeffrey Epstein. Does anybody believe that Jeffrey Epstein killed himself? Which takes the most assumptions? The coincidence theory that they lost the tapes and the wrong people were supposed to be guarding them and they disappeared and all this kind of stuff. And then this guy hung himself even though he clearly didn't want to die. Is that 
uh, look at Occam's razor, which takes some more assumptions. Or this guy knew a bunch of stuff about a bunch of really important people, and everybody knew the day he went into jail and talked all day long on social media that he was going to be killed, and then he died. Nobody believes that Jeffrey Epstein killed himself. Nobody. Occam's razor. But there are people out there that still use the epithet conspiracy theory, even though the CIA created the term conspiracy theory to cast dispersions on people that actually start asking questions. Now, I admit, most conspiracy theories are bull. Some of them are overtly stupid. They would take more trouble than, and and I'm not going to say I know, I don't know. I just look at things and I go, okay, what's the most likely thing to have happened here? And I'm almost always right, 99.6% of the time. (laughs) And so here we go. Now we've got a conspiracy theory that somehow the president of the United States has been infected with COVID and he's going to die before the election and That's going to throw everything into turmoil. They're going to try to get Nancy Pelosi in there or something else is going to happen or it's just going to uh, cause uh, 99.4. But that's because of today because I got something wrong today, Danielle. So here's the thing. If you were going to try to assassinate the president, (laughs) would you infect him? With a uh, a, a virus that has a 99.96% survival rate amongst people over the age of 70? Apply Occam's razor. The BBC conspiracy theory. I don't know what that is. Send it to me in private message. I'll look it up. I don't know. I don't think I'm going to want to get into every every, uh, conspiracy theory. I'm just trying to teach people how to think. If you were the deep state and you've shown you have the ability to assassinate people, Jeffrey Epstein for one, JFK, very possibly Ronald Reagan, shot by, I don't know uh, uh, how that happened, but I'm not saying I know anything. I'm just saying. Would you infect the president with a virus that has a 99.96% survival rate amongst people who have who have uh, uh, have gotten the, the, the virus? I, that doesn't make sense to me. That doesn't mean something didn't happen. We don't know anything. And that's the biggest thing you could take away from this. We don't know anything. And most of the time, we don't know anything. We're all making assumptions. Am I streaming on more than one streaming app? Yes, I am currently right now streaming on YouTube, which is the main uh, portal. I'm also streaming on um, Facebook on three different channels on Facebook and on uh, Periscope. All right, so everybody's not going to see everybody's comments, and I might be having a conversation with somebody, and you're not seeing their comments. If everybody would write a comment and everybody would put uh, questions in there, we could like shift around and we could talk about a lot of different things. So, yes, it's possible things are happening that we don't know. It is very, very, very possible that there's an attempt underway. I'm not saying it's true. I personally don't think that that's what's going on. But it's possible there's an attempt underway to, uh, you know, for this to happen. I have no idea. It doesn't make sense to me. It doesn't make sense to me that this is be be how it happens. Don't know. We'll wait and see. And so here's the way we think about this. I have a whole series called How to Think, where we look at logic fallacies and we look at reason and we look at how to understand things. How do we understand the news? How do we deal with conspiracy theories? First of all, is that we have to recognize that Uh, conspiracy theories happen. They're happening all the time. They happen right out in the open. (laughs) They are not what you think. There are people who are working right now 
and have been working since before, since 2016, to remove this president from office, regardless of anything he's done or not done. That has been going on. That's documented. All right. So there are people that don't like him, and you all know a lot of those people. And there, those things are very, very probable to be going on. I just don't think it doesn't make sense to me that this would be the way something like that would happen. So the way we think about it is when we don't know and something doesn't make sense to us, we take it and we shelve it. We just think about it and then we put it on the shelf. Later on, some more information comes out. Perhaps something else that's provable happens. You can begin to perhaps start putting things together. The way that uh, conspiracy theorists work, and I'm talking about 90% of them that are false, is that they make assumptions, they base their theories on in huge leaps of logic and fallacies, and then they pile those things together so that there's so many of them that the average person not willing to think and not willing to separate things out and ask simple questions just goes, okay, well, that sounds like that's what, ha that's what happens. Most people are also not willing to do what I do every day, and I hope you do every day, and that is ask yourself, what if you're wrong? Is it possible that you're wrong? Is it possible that you believe something that's not true? This not only helps us with our humility, but it helps us not go off and be dragged off into something that causes us to make bad decisions. You can ask whatever you want. I don't know that I'm always going to answer every question, but I got to scroll up here. Uh, make sure I didn't miss any. If I miss something, just type it in again. I don't know what's going on with Andrew. Uh, I think I missed something. All right. I'm trying to scroll down here and see. Ooh. All right, so, oh, yeah, we're talking about protecting Andrew from uh, Jeffrey Epstein. All right, I caught up with that. Uh, only maybe if the doctors on the inside are corrupt. That's one thing I said to my wife. We don't know, and that's, at that point, you just don't know. And, and saying I don't know is perfectly acceptable. Hey, everybody, hit the like button. Make sure you do that. Subscribe. Go to YouTube and subscribe. Uh. How big a mix of agent provocateurs and true believers do you figure in Antifa, BLM, Proud Boys, and whoever else is doing all the crazy crap in this city? I would say it's probably more than 50%. My own personal, actual, on-hand experience in traveling around for years and quite often speaking before different groups of various uh, opposite viewpoints, including militia groups, is that more than 50% were pro provocateurs or were there on behest of somebody else trying to stir up trouble. More than 50%, and that's almost certainly what's going on with Antifa, BLM, and some of these other groups. That's why I don't participate with them anymore. Do I believe that aliens help make the pyramids? No. And for the same reason, Occam's razor. I do believe, however, that those societies that uh, predated what we call modern history were very likely more technologically advanced than ours. This whole theory is developed in my book, Futurity, which has not been uh, republished as a novel yet. But um, uh, so I believe that there was uh, very advanced societies on the earth that were not alien. Making them alien just adds a whole big assumption that's completely unprovable. But I believe that they were uh, more. Uh, and one of the reasons that I believe this is as technology advances, it becomes more and more throwaway. We have more evidence of Stone Age civilization than we do uh, things that were built in the 20s and the 1910s and the 1890s because those things were built with wood. We still have the Colosseum. So after an apocalyptic event, people go back to building with stone and building with more permanent materials. Those things stick around for thousands of years. As technology advances, it becomes more and more throwaway. Things are not uh, meant to stick around. Houses are made cheaper and more shoddy, and things um, degrade. 
uh, faster so there's less evidence of some societies than there are. You aren't going to find much evidence unless it's been rebuilt through time of things built in the 1870s in the West. They just don't exist anymore. So uh, that's one of my uh, beliefs about that. It's developed in great detail in my book, Futurity. All right, everybody's saying hi to each other. Uh, the more I know, the more I don't know. I, that's exactly true. That's the way it's supposed to work. So that's how we think about that. All right, so if we have more questions, I'll, I'll, I can hop topics. I can go back to uh, topics about conspiracy theories. But I hope you've learned something about how to think. Don't commit yourself to theories, whether they come from the government, whether they come from politicians, whether they come from the news, whether they come from your neighbor, whether they come from your church, that are based on too many unprovable or unknown assumptions. My thoughts on the Nephilim, will they exist in Genesis chapter 9? And after that, according to the scriptures, I can't go into a whole lesson on the Nephilim. Though. Someday, you guys remind me, Always you can private message me or you can send me messages on Facebook and say, hey, do a show on the Nephilim. But the Nephilim, that word just means giants. There were giants in the land in those days and after that, according to the scriptures. Now, what do I think about who they were? That's in my commentary on Genesis, <laughs> which I've gotten through chapter 10. So I've already covered the, the Nephilim. Yes, I will do a show on the Nephilim. If you guys, you can't, you can't remind me here on the show. All right. So a good friend of mine, uh, author John L. Monk, who's a good friend. I don't think he watches my show, but uh, he would be smarter if he did. He's a good, he's a smart guy. Anyways, he um, he posted an interesting post on Facebook, and he said, uh, "What is the most important book you've ever read?" Now, what people did is they do what they do with everything, is they change the question in their heads. One thing you'll know about me is I answer the question. <laughs> and so uh, people answer the question, what is the most important book to you? In other words, what book was the most important to you, to your development? So everything was about them. Every book, there, you know, people were like, "Boy, where the red fern grows," or uh, Nancy Drew, because it made my parents stop fighting, or something, something that had something to do with them. And I answered, and it said fiction book. So let me get that straight before everybody hollers at me for not saying the Bible. The fiction book. What is the most important fiction book you've ever read? And I said, "A Day in the Life of." Ivan Denisovich, or even, I say even Denisovich, but I'm going to say Ivan because some of you are going to go look for the book and I want you to find it. A Day in the Life of Ivan Denisovich by Alexander Solzhenitsyn. John responded to me and he said, isn't this just a subjective thing though? Isn't your idea of an important book or a literature book or Dostoevsky or something Russian because you like Russian literature, just really your own personal preference rather than somebody else saying, they like uh, Dune because it got them reading sci-fi. No, <laughs> it's not subjective. A day in the life of Ivan Denisovich led to directly uh, causation wise to the fall of the Soviet Union, <laughs> which had killed a hundred million people in one in one uh, century. All right. So they're not the same. That's not, that's not a subjective justification. That just means that a book that led, and I can trace, and I did it for my wife today, the direct uh, cause and effect that led to the fall of the Soviet Union to the book, A Day in the Life of Ivan Denisovich by uh, Solzhenitsyn. Let me do it for you really quickly. You can find some of this information in a book by uh, Solzhenitsyn called The Oak and the Calf. The Oak and the Calf was a book that Solzhenitsyn wrote about the publication of A Day in the Life. So let me give you a little background of what was going on. In the 1950s, the 1960s, the 1970s, going back to the 1940s in the Soviet Union, you didn't get to write books about what you wanted to write about. You could write them, but no one would ever see them. They were illegal unless they were approved by the censors. Nobody was allowed to pu uh, publish a book unless it was approved by the Soviet censors, all right? 
You got Denisovic spelled wrong there, War Dog. It's D E N I S O V I T C H. All right. And so here's the way this works. A, uh, I'm too smart to believe in coincidence theories. <laughs> Sometimes things are divinely ordained. He wrote the book, A Day in the Life, which basically covers a day in the life of a guy named Ivan Denisovich Shukov, who was in the Gulag, which was a prison camp system throughout uh, Siberia, eastern Russia, where they put political dissidents, criminals, and people who were accused of um, saying bad things about Stalin or Khrushchev or whoever was the guy in power. And so uh, uh, this guy, Ivan Denisovich Shukov, is in a uh, prison camp 30 below zero or 40 below zero or more in the Gulag in Siberia. And it's just a day in his life. It's what a day in his life is like. And you find out why he was in prison. He was in prison because he got cut off from his army unit and was captured by the Germans and didn't do anything wrong and was held as a prisoner of war and escaped. That meant to the Soviets that you were a German spy. And so he was sent to a prison camp uh, for 10 years. Starting in 1941, this book takes place uh, uh, in his life around 1951. Been in prison camp 10 years. All right, so it's just a day, and it's a day that went pretty well for him. He woke up, and he was sick, and he didn't know whether he should go to the infirmary or not, and so he's just thinking about whether he should go to the infirmary and what they're going to get to eat that day, which is mostly going to be a fish gruel and some type of grass-based soup. All right, so that's what he's thinking about. So then he goes through his day and it's like little things that happen that end up being, he's got a spoon. I um, borrowed this imagery for anybody who likes to read books and who are liter- uh, literate. Uh, he had a, has a spoon that he keeps in his shoe that he made in one of the earlier camps out of aluminum wire. He melted it and poured it into a sand uh, mold and he has a spoon and he's able to eat. So he's got this thing, good things happening every day. They look at a thermometer and if it's 41 degrees below zero, they don't have to work. He wakes up this day and it's 30 around 30 below. So he knows he's going to have to go to work. He's late getting out of bed and the warden is going to throw him into the hole, but that's just a ruse because the warden wants the floor clean. I'm not going to tell you the whole story. I'm not going to plain spoiler the whole book. I'm just saying he wrote this book about this guy who goes through this day in this pr- prison camp, who hasn't done anything wrong, who should not be in prison. He's there because of the Stalin era cult of personality, and that becomes clear and evident in the book. At the same time, Khrushchev is now in power, and Khrushchev wants to shed the weight and the uh, the uh, the parts of Stalinism that he doesn't like. He doesn't want people following Stalin. He wants them following him. So he wants to separate from Stalin's cult of personality. So he's looking out there and he tells all the censors, try to find a book or a piece of literature or poetry that we can use that will begin to have people understand what was happening under Stalin, even though it was still happening under Khrushchev. So Khrushchev says, tells the censors, look for it. Um, uh, uh, Solzhenitsyn's like, I don't know, no one's ever going to publish this book, but I'll send it anyway. He sent it to a magazine called Novi Mir, which was a progressive for them, which would be a conservative for America, a magazine that was always trying to get things published that had literary merit. They didn't really care about the politics if it had literary merit. And so, um, uh, Novi Mir got it. They wanted to publish it. They gave it to the censor. The censor showed it to Khrushchev. Khrushchev read it and said, yep, this is the one. Let him publish it. Shocked everybody. So he published the book. The book took the world by storm. It opened, it caused what was called the thaw, which meant artists and creatives like you and me started thinking, hey, we could actually publish things that have 
literary merit and that tell the truth about the society. And so people started writing things. And after that, Cruz was like, no, 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 no. That's not what we intended. But it was too late. The cat was out of the bag. Other works, including where other works by Solzhenitsyn, started uh, being published in magazines like Novi Mir. Solzhenitsyn wrote a book called The Gulag Archipelago, which was smuggled out of the country, which alerted the whole world to the Gulag system after they'd read about Ivan Denisovich, and they were shocked and appalled that the Soviet Union was basically a huge prison camp, which is what happens under communism and Marxism every time. And so here's the thing. <laughs> that led to what happened over the next 30 years. And over the next 30 years, there was a degradation. More people, Less people were willing to help the Soviet Union. The, the, the West was hardened in their opposition against communism. They spent more and more money while the Soviet Union, Union was not able economically to compete. When Reagan came to power, he shut off the taps for any technological advances even a speaking spell, a child's speaking spell could not be shipped to Russia. And uh, Russia was collapsing internally. And now we have the fall of the, um, of the uh, Soviet Union because of a day in the life of Ivan Denisovich. My whole point is that that's what happens. It's not the same. That book has more value, is more important than Nancy Drew. Nancy Drew is a great book, a series of books, okay? I'm glad people read them and got into literature. Didn't uh, bring the downfall of a system that killed 100 million people, all right? So if you're out there, hit the like button. You just got a lesson, but I want you to tell you that you can go down in the comment, excuse me, in the description of this video on YouTube and you can find a link, a link to a day in the life of even Denise of it. If you go there, it's an associate's link and I get like three kopecks or cents or uh, drachma or whatever. I get uh, a few pennies, all right? So appreciate you guys all being here. I'm going to scroll up here. I probably missed a bunch of stuff. Uh, yeah, in a day in life, even Denisovich is not a Russian uh, 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 door doorstop. It's a short book. You can read it in a day, all right? It's a fantastic book. You have to learn how to read Russian literature. All right. You have to learn how to read because most of you don't even know how to read because you read garbage. And so if you learn how to read it, you can uh, understand it. Get yourself a, 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 a reader's guide or something like that that helps you understand the book or ask me. I'll be glad to help you. All right. What uh, drew me to Russian history and literature? Uh, I started off reading American literature, as most of us do. Stephen Crane and um, uh, James Fenimore Cooper. And uh, Mark Twain, which is fantastic. And I liked some of it. I liked the Southern authors quite a bit. However, the history that is involved in Western literature and American literature is not very long. So most uh, uh, Western literature, it just, um, it's very perfunctory. It's, to me, it just doesn't have a thousand years of history behind it. And so I started re reading English literature, which I like very much. I like Thomas Hardy. I like Jonathan Swift, not as much. <laughs> I like the, uh, you know, Treasure Island and, uh, you know, I, the normal books you're supposed to read. I read them and they were really good, but uh, I, and although it had more history, uh, I just didn't find it as fulfilling or as illustrative of the uh, human condition. So after that, I read Gulag Archipelago, which is not fiction, written by uh, Solzhenitsyn. And I got into Solzhenitsyn. I read all of the Gulag books, which is thousands and thousands of pages. And I read some of his short stories. And I got into reading it. And I thought, you know, I'm going to read Tolstoy's War and Peace. And I tried to read it three times over about 10 years, and I just couldn't get through it. It was just com completely beyond me because it was, to me, at the time, I was stupider. I said it was boring because there was too many characters and they, like, they, everything was happening at a party. And there was like 5,000 characters and it was hard to keep the names and all this kind of stuff, and I just couldn't get through it. So I tried Dostoevsky, had some of the same problems. I thought, well, I guess Russian literature is not for me. 
And then we were doing a December project, which is back in the day, we would not go to town for a month or two months at all. No social media, no uh, computers, no internet, no nothing for a month or two. And I sat down again and I said, I'm going to read War and Peace. And this time I read the whole book and it is fantastic. It is so good. And what I learned is that the reason all those characters exist and the reason that they take so long and their books are so thick is because they're uh, there, there's an overall arcing lesson throughout the books. And you actually are, are able to track it and understand at the end, the reason it's called War and Peace is because the first part of the book is when they were at peace. Same characters, same places, same things. And then you track those characters going from peace into war. And it's fantastic. And so the more I read about that, the more I realized that our civilization, what we call civilization, when you look around, you drive over a bridge, when you drive by a, uh, a building that's been there a couple of hundred years, or when you uh, experience uh, uh, market day, or like we did today, Fiesta de la Paloma, and you don't have to go with uh, an army to keep you from being murdered, and uh, civilization exists, that that civilization actually started in... Uh, in Russia, it, it, it moved through Russia before it moved into Western Europe. All right. And so the Greeks and all of those that kind of things had, it had a great form um, of civilization, but what we experience as civilization uh, very much came, uh, moved westward. And uh, towards the end, Marxism, Leninism, and all, uh, French, um, uh, style revolution moved eastward from uh, Western Europe into Russia. All that's to say that I found out uh, more about the world and about humans and about people and how we live uh, by reading Russian literature. And it's just better writing. They're just better stories. All right. Don says, Glenn Beck said yesterday that he has seen the plan and play by the Democrats to stop Trump. And it's the millions of unsolicited ballots sent out, which will appear if need be to overcome any vote. We don't know. I don't believe Glenn Beck, but um, he could be right. He could be wrong. And that was the whole beginning of the show. We don't know. That's what conspiracy uh, theories quite often are, is somebody saying they know something and us all going, oh, well, that makes sense. Uh, I have no I, no doubt, as I said earlier in the show, that there's pl there are plans in place uh, to uh, fudge around with the election. No doubt. All right, I got to scroll down. I sat on Khrushchev's grave and smoked a Cuban cigar. Nice. It was glorious. Khrushchev and Yeltsin are the only Soviet Russian leader not buried among the wall of the Kremlin. <laughs> Khrushchev later on in life, uh, Khrushchev banned Boris Pasternak's Dr. Zhivago. Also a fantastic book that had to be smuggled out of Russia and was published in Milan in the late 1950s, early 1960s. And uh, Khrushchev had it banned, read it after he was forced from power and was sorry that he had it banned. So you got to give him that one thing. <laughs> First time commenting, love the show, always enjoyed the chats, good group. I read this book in school, uh, in school suspension, <laughs> suspension work then. Uh, all right. Thank you, everybody. I appreciate you. Crime and punishment in my early 20s, it uh, floored me. Amazing writing is true. Who wrote it? Jason, that's Dostoevsky, Crime and Punishment. Fyodor <laughs> Dostoevsky. All right, y'all, if you have questions or comments. Uh, Michael, why are you yelling, Chuck? Take the all caps off. It makes it harder to read and nobody likes it. I love reading Jack London's books of adventure, but I also love biographies, autobiographies. With those things in mind, what three books would you recommend? I have 3,000 books, and I recommend all of them. Um, I have no idea. Uh, uh, autobiographies and biographies. Uh, I have so many. I pulled out three today that are theological in nature. But um, I, I just even wouldn't even know where to begin. I'd have to think about that. I will think about it. All right. If you have questions or comments or something you want to talk about, get them in here. Uh after this is over, I'm going to sit down with Mrs. Bunker and we're going to watch the finale of season two of Yellowstone. I've already watched it. I've already watched season three, but I'm watching it back again with her. I like that show, but I also like Russian literature. I like American literature. 
I like literature in general. So uh, definitely get A Day in the Life of Ivan Denisovich. Have I read System of the World by Newton? I don't know, and I think I would know if I had. Maybe if it was in um, uh, uh, a collection of his works, I might have read it. But I did not read it as a standalone. I probably ought to. So I'm going to say no is going to be my final answer. All right, y'all, we're at uh, 45 minutes. And so that's usually when uh, I'm just telling people, I'm here for you if you have a question or you have a topic or something you want to talk about. It doesn't have to be politics. doesn't have to be literature. It can be whatever you want to talk about. I hope you've learned something about examining conspiracy theories reasonably and how to think about them. I would like to review your book, Wick, on my channel. Absolutely. Is it okay to message you? Absolutely. Always. Anything, anything like that you want to talk about, just message me and I'd be glad to talk to you about it. All right. So, and I recommend, highly recommend Wick. If you are not yet into Russian literature and you want to read an American uh, piece of literature, this book, Wick, written by Michael Bunker with Chris A. Walt, is one I recommend. It is a Russian style book. It is a lot of pages and little teeny, teeny print. <laughs> But it's a fascinating book, and uh, it, it's a Ru it's Russian style, but it takes place in America. Uh, did I want to uh, comment on the Michigan Supreme Court? I really don't know enough. I read the stuff that you posted. I saw that uh, people were still kind of uncertain when. What happened was the Michigan Supreme Court ruled that the Michigan, gov Michigan governor's executive orders were unconstitutional and uh, um, reversed, I think, all of them for a certain period of time including uh, her actions during the uh, COVID. And so uh, I think I just got to wait and see what happens. Um, they don't usually give up that easily. So we'll see. Hopefully uh, stuff like that. My main concern has nothing to do with COVID, has nothing to do with pandemic. I just don't think that governors, and as I said here in uh, the state of Texas, and I said this over a month or two months ago, they don't have the right to do what they're doing. They're ruling they're making legislation by executive order, and that is not what executive orders are for, nor are they allowed to do it. So hopefully that's a precedent, and it's going to be carried forward. I know there are lawsuits in many, many, many states that are in the same vein. Wick is the best book I've read by modern authors. Well, thank you very much. Uh, that's uh, And I, people should read it. There's a lot of stuff. There's a lot of philosophy in that book that you can learn and you can uh, help yourself. All right, y'all, I'm going to call it quits. Starting to get late. I got to save a little bit of power so we can watch one episode, the fallacy, the fallacy, the finale of uh, uh, season two of Yellowstone. I appreciate you guys being here. If you would do me the favor, all of you who are watching this right now, if you've gotten this far, if you're a future person, go to YouTube and find me there. All you have to do is type in Michael Bunker, you'll find it, or just go to youtube.com forward slash bunkdad. And you'll find me there and find this video, like the video, subscribe to my channel. We need more subscribers. Once we get over 2,000, things should really start um, taking off a little bit more. We're at like 1,860. So we really need all of the help. So everybody that's watching this, go to YouTube. After the video is over, uh, give us a like and, and subscribe. I appreciate you guys watching. As always, God bless you. I love you. I hope everything's going well for you. Hope to see you soon. If I don't, if I'm not back on here tomorrow, it might be the next day, but I'll see you soon. And when I see you, talk to you later.